Geraldine Ferraro once said, It was not so very long ago that people thought semiconductors were part-time orchestra leaders, and microchips were very, very small snack foods. Sadly, I think that some people out there still believe that. Hi there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 480 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. So let's talk about some chips, shall we? A little later on, Dr. I.L. Cohen, co-founder and CEO of Cognifiber, is joining me to talk all about the photonic computing revolution. The details of their glass-based chip, yes, you heard me right, glass-based chip, how the proprietary fibers and embedded waveguides work in their glass chips, and how the advancement of this kind of technology could bring in big-time change to the world of edge computing. But before we bring in Dr. Cohen, it's time for a little news you may have missed. Semiconductors grow on trees? Addition. Did you know that electronics could someday grow on trees? Okay, yes, that's a bit more in the realm of science fiction than science fact. But get this. A team of researchers at Osaka University have created a nanocellulose paper semiconductor. And even better, it has a wide electrical tunability and can be customized because of the trans scalability of its structural design. Okay, let's back up a second. The basis of this technology is cellulose, which is derived from wood. From there, cellulose nanofibers, or nanocellulose as it also can be called, can be made into flexible nanocellulose paper, which is also called nanopaper. Now, nanopaper does not conduct electrical current, but the heating of this nanopaper does introduce conducting properties. Unfortunately, heat can also disrupt the nanostructure of the nanopaper as well. And this is where this team from Osaka University comes in. They discovered a way to heat up this nanopaper without damaging the structures of the paper from the nanoscale all the way up to the macroscale. Study author Hirotaka Kaga explains the process like this. He says, We applied an iodine treatment that was very effective for protecting the nanostructure of the nanopaper. Combining this with spatially controlled drying meant that the pyrolysis treatment did not substantially alter the design structures, and the selected temperature could be used to control the electrical properties. So, a very important part of this nanopaper semiconductor is that flexibility part. So get this, these researchers actually used origami, or paper folding, and kirigami, paper cutting techniques, to show how this nanopaper could behave on a macro level. They were able to fold this nanopaper into shapes like a bird and a box, and even punched out shapes like an apple and a snowflake. They were even also able to cut out more intricate shapes using a laser cutter as well. And the best part? Any heat applied during these processes did not seem to affect the nanopaper at all. This team at Osaka University was able to develop some successful applications using nanopaper semiconductor sensors incorporated into wearable devices that were able to detect exhaled moisture breaking through face masks and moisture on the skin. This nanopaper semiconductor was also used within a glucose biofuel cell as an electrode, and the energy it produced was enough to power a small light bulb. Professor Kaga and his team are very hopeful about the future of this technology. He says, 
The structure maintenance and tunability that we have been able to show is very encouraging for the translation of nanomaterials into practical devices. We believe that our approach will underpin the next steps in sustainable electronics made entirely from plant materials. Wow. So if you want to check out even more information about this super cool study coming out of Osaka University, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com. All right, it's time to bring in Dr. Cohen from Cognifiber and talk all about glass-based chips. Let's go. Hi, Yael. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Amelia. It's nice being here. Excellent. Okay, so first, for my audience who may not know, what is Cognifiber all about? So in general, in Cognifiber, we do photonic computing. That is computing with pulses of light instead of electrons. So we are not the only one doing it. But the thing is that we are doing the whole compute from start to end using the photonic system without any writing or reading from memory. This accelerates the process of computing very much and we use it for AI applications. So recently you guys announced the development of a glass-based photonic chip. So tell me more about this chip and what kind of technical problems are you looking to solve here? So in general, we want to give very high speed service with low cost and also uh, high sustainability because of the low power we are using. So putting a lot of fiber is also a large volume in some cases, in some of the implementation, and we want to reduce this volume in order for our system to be deployed not only in data centers, but also on the edge. And I don't mean on the edge like on a small bottles or so, or very small object, but on micro centers at the edge, like hubs that gather a lot of information and process information locally before it's transmitted to data centers or to relieve some of the flow of data to data centers. So, Yael, I'm very interested in your proprietary technology as well. Can you give me some details on the proprietary fibers and embedded waveguides in your glass chip? Yeah, so our idea was how to put a neural network, how to implement it in a single fiber. For that, we used a type of fiber, which is called multi-core fiber. It's a single fiber, but with many cores, each one of them capable of guiding light in the same way like a single core fiber does. But instead of using these cores where it's used in communication, where they keep them far apart to uh, avoid crosstalk noise or crosstalk contamination of the data, we deliberately put some of the cores one next to the other very closely in order to have them interact with each other. And we use a specific amplification to specific cores within this fiber in order to control this crosstalk. In this way, we take noise and turn noise into compute. It's a very similar way that You can treat it like a drain and a source, which are both of them uh, conducting electrons, and you use the gate as a control to control the flow of electrons, especially if we talk about analog transistors. In the same way, when we have several cores, which are very close, so one core can control the flow of light that comes from the source core to the destination core. And so we can have both routing, but also compute in the same way the transistor can form logic gates, etc. So like in semiconductor, instead of pool of transistors, we have pool of cores. Today, it's possible to generate fibers with hundreds of thousands of cores. It is done for imaging. So imagine you have this huge pool of cores of fibers, and we can program their function using the amplification light. In the same way, we use the transistors in a semiconductor chip. Excellent. Now, your technology is aimed at edge computing, like you mentioned. What specific applications are you looking at? And can you talk a little bit about the potential advancements in these types of applications? Sure, sure. The first architecture we are implementing is called autoencoder. Autoencoder is a quite simple neural network, normally five to seven layers, sometimes a bit more, but 
five to seven layers mostly is sufficient. When first there are being the encoder, when you have a convergent uh, structure, the, the number of elements is going down and down until you have the minimal uh, representation of the data. Uh, that's called the latent stage. And then you have uh, the decoder, which converges again back to the same size of the input. This is doing actually a reconstruction of the data, but after the machine learns the distribution of the whole data. So the reconstructed data is not the original data. It's actually the closest point to the original data, but using the distribution it learned. What do we get from that? First, the data that goes out is denoised. There is no noise. Only the major information is kept. Now, if you deduce the output from the input, you get a difference. And this difference is very important. If it's small, that means what we see is something that is connected to the learned data the system has learned. It's something within the normal distribution. For example, if the system learned how to recognize dogs and you give it a dog it never saw, so it will say, okay, there's a small difference between the other dog I saw and this dog, but you will know it belongs to this distribution. But if it will see, let's say, a mouse, it's very different from a dog, it will then say, oh, there's a big difference. It wouldn't know what it is because we didn't train it on mouse. It actually doesn't know what dog is, but it would know that it's very different than what it learned before. So we use this difference to generate what's called anomaly detection. Every pattern taken from industry, from life, from health, everyday life, we generate patterns, of course, biology generate patterns, communication generate patterns, machine generate patterns. Now we can learn any pattern, the normal distribution of a pattern, and then monitor it. In this way, if something peculiar happens, then we can have an immediate response of the system saying, oh, something is you know, different. Look, we need to check it and to respond accordingly. And now if you talk about factories called industrial IoT, so predictive maintenance is one of the main things that we use uh, anomaly detection for, either in sound or in vision or just uh, parameters coming from various sensors. But you can also monitor the flow of people in areas in smart cities. And if something very peculiar happened, like people don't walk on walkways or people running, streaming, uh, you know, then you will see a big difference from the standard pattern. Then you can really apply this also to safety, security, uh, homeland security in smart cities, for example. In cybersecurity, for example, one of the classic cases is to look for the log data. Each log data is stored. And then you can uh, learn the regular patterns of communication between elements in the network. And if something looks weird, that means you need to check it more. And that is one of the major tools of cybersecurity. Anomaly detection is actually about 16% of all cybersecurity today. So we think our system, these auto encoders that can learn and identify anomalous cases would be very important for this uh, application. But I want to stress out where specifically it will be important because we can, using the photonic computing, our advantage is when there is huge mass of data and we need to know the answer in real time, period, uh, immediate response. That's where our system will be most advantageous because our product is supposed to give up to 500 million times per second of a task process. So half a billion tasks per second. That's something which is over 100 times faster than any existing uh, tool today, unless we take a football uh, size uh, field supercomputer. But we are not talking about supercomputers. We are talking about, you know, a one rack or half a rack size, something that can be stationed almost everywhere on-prem or in data centers. So that is our main advantage in our first products. That's excellent, Yael. I Amazing, actually. Okay, well, I think it's time for your off-the-cuff question. I'm ready. So, Eyal, a lot of us can't have our favorite foods due to lockdown, restaurants being closed. We can't get to that restaurant for one reason or another. So, Eyal, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, what would you have? In terms of a full meal, my favorite is actually green curry. It's a chicken with green curry and rice. Uh, Thai food. Um, that's, I think, one of my favorite. Uh, in local food, I would say 
probably uh, knafe is one of the favorite desserts in Israel. Okay. Uh, it, it has a very, uh, very thin hair of uh, dough and a very nice goat cheese. It's mm. semi-sweet uh, uh, and, and uh, salty. Mm. It's very, very good. I really recommend it. It sounds amazing. <laughs> all right, Yael, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Emilia. It was a pleasure. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on Apple Podcasts. It really does help spread the word. Also, if you'd like any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Frying page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of May 6th, 2022, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.